Let's make sure. Well, thank you, Dee, for the introduction and for inviting me. Wait. You want me to use the mic? I think it's good. Okay. Can you take it out? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Does this work better? Yeah, get it close. Get it close. Okay. And it's really an honor for me to be here this evening among you uh, military officers and uh, this is something new for me. Um, as you know, the topic of my conversation or my speech tonight is I never thought my son would become a soldier. And in order for me to talk about this, I think you need to hear a little bit of background about who I am and where I'm from, which might explain a few things. Um, so, oh, and before I start this, how many of you are grandparents or parents? Wow. Almost everyone. Um, so you can relate to my story of my three sons. So um, I was born in Denmark. And I was raised the first six years of my life in Nigeria, West Africa. Then we moved to Paris. My parents uh, moved there. And after that, we went to, uh, I finished my education in England. And it wasn't until the age of 25 that I came to the US and met my American husband through an ad in a newspaper. And we've been married since uh, 87 or 86. And uh, we've lived in Orange County since, or I've lived in Orange County since 1983, except for one year, which is what my story is about. In 2004, my husband and I decided to chuck everything we had, sell everything, uproot our three sons who were aged 16, 13, and 10, and move to Belize in Central America. Okay, so we went from a house on a lake, let me check here, this house in Lake Forest, a five bedroom house, and we moved to a hut on stilts in Belize within one day. And so you can imagine how three boys from Orange County reacted to this. Um, Where's why, my skateboard? <laughs> why did we do this? Well, we had many, many reasons. The main one being that life in Orange County we thought was too materialistic. Um, we were fed up with the entitlement attitudes of young kids. Uh, we were fed up with the peer pressures. And we were fed up with a lot of our neighbors, and I'm not saying everyone, but some of them, who would, when their kids turned 16, buy them this. And we also um, were fed up with, um, well, I'm just giving this as an example. It could be a new tribe or anything. I wasn't raised that way in Europe, and I didn't understand this, but anyway. Um, and then this, this drove me nuts. The number of presents under the Christmas tree, and the fact that my kids would, I would watch them, and they would just open and rip the paper off, next, next. And grandpa, I'm sorry to say, but grandparents, a lot of grandparents were bringing, you know, many, many presents, which I understand grandparents like to do, but I wanted my kids to appreciate things. And um, my husband also had a very stressful job with long commutes going to Los Angeles, and he wasn't spending time with the boys. So I worried about his health. Um, he had, as I said, a high-stress job. I worried him that he would have a heart attack in his 40s and, uh, or a stroke. And we reached the point where we were so fed up that we longed for a simple life. And we wanted to escape to a Caribbean island. The only thing is that everything we had researched was way too expensive and we couldn't afford any of those gorgeous islands or anything. So one day, it happened by pure chance, had it not been for a leaking toilet, we may never have discovered this country Belize, which a plumber from Scotland came to my house, fixed my toilet, and I started asking him, where are you going to retire? 
because he was at that age and he said, well, Belize. And I said, well, where's Belize? I've never heard of it. And he said, it is, um, it used to be British Honduras. Okay. And, thank you, yeah. British Honduras. And I felt stupid. I felt, well, you know, I went to school in England. I should know where British Honduras is. <laughs> But I didn't. So it's this little yellow country here, which is south of Mexico, and it's in Central America. So you can just drive through Mexico. In fact, that's what my husband ended up doing, was from California to Belize in four days by car. Um, and he said, you can find oceanfront property for $50,000. And I thought he was joking. I, so I spent the whole day just Googling different locations in Belize, and I was so excited that he was right. In fact, you could buy islands for $100,000, and it just sounded too good to be true. So that gave my husband and I a completely new focus, and uh, we got very excited about uh, moving over there, and then my kids thought we were joking. They were like, come on, you're not moving to Belize. And uh, I would ask, you know, parents would ask me, so what, what do your kids think about a decision like this? And I would say, well, who makes the decisions in your house? Is it you or your children? And I know that might be a little harsh, but the whole point was that um, I would use my European background as my excuse for uh, being an alien. And um, parents were shocked, some of them. So my husband and I decided we would go and check out Belize, and there were three parts that we wanted to look at to find a home. Uh, our adventure started in a rusty Suzuki samurai, and we had the best time exploring the country. Have any of you been to Belize? Oh, okay, three of you. You've heard of the Hummingbird Highway? Um, it's a gorgeous highway, and we were driving along that, and... Um, I, this is an excerpt from my book. Uh, barefoot kids walked alongside the road, sucking on juicy mangoes with orange flesh dripping like ice cream cones in the heat. Some kids stopped to stare at our white faces. Others started running as if trying to beat our car to the finish line. Solitary shacks appeared with nothing but a hammock inside them. A few chickens roamed the premises, and sometimes a lone skinny cow or a horse re remained close to a shack. I wondered whether the cow or the horse represented a local status symbol, the Belizean version, version of a BMW on the driveway. What a, difference in, what a different environment from ours back home. What would my boys think? So when we first moved, we lived in that hut on stilts that I showed you, and there was no glass in the windows, a palm-fronded roof, which I'm sure you know about from living in Africa, geckos, giant ants, scorpions, and other critters living with us. And the boys hated it. They absolutely hated the first few days, weeks. Uh, they wouldn't get out of the hut, uh, scorpions coming out the drain in the shower and refusing to wash. Um, after days inside, they started exploring the jungle. And my middle son, Alec, um, he touched a poisonwood tree. And I don't know if any of you have heard of the poisonwood tree, but some people are highly allergic. It's like poison ivy, but worse. And his face got turned, within hours, turned completely red. His eyes were so swollen he couldn't open them. And his skin on his hand, uh, he blistered up all over. And this lasts five weeks. And um, another little excerpt was Alex, Alex blisters had grown into half-inch raised mounds of yellow liquid. Mom, it hurts so bad I can't move, he said with a groan. I worried he hadn't eaten in more than 24 hours. Duke, he's burning hot and needs a doctor. At six foot three and 135 pounds, Alec could not afford to lose another ounce. He'd had a huge growth spurt between his 13th and 14th birthdays. Being a picky eater, especially in Belize, didn't help. Duke agreed we had to get him to a doctor right away. I can't walk, Alex sobbed as I helped him get dressed. How could I put my son's health at risk by taking him to Belize? What if the doctors weren't qualified? What if hospitals didn't use sterilized equipment? What about AIDS? 
It took him five weeks to heal, and on his 14th birthday, we had absolutely no presents or anything, unlike the Christmas tree. Um, so what we decided to do was to take our children on a tour of the Mayan ruins. And uh, we took them to Lamanai, and at first they didn't want to go, but afterwards I know that this is a memory that he will, he's brought it up since then, and he will remember this for the rest of his life. And then the kids started exploring and snorkeling, and my husband's very good at finding treasure in the Bay of Chetamal, the shallow waters, and uh, found an old, my son uh, Jordan found an old whiskey bottle. Uh, this is uh, the Mayan ruins in Lamanai, and the old whiskey bottle. And then we were thinking about schools, okay, so of course we did our research beforehand and we planned on sending our kids to the local schools because they speak English in Belize, it's the first language, and all the guidebooks said the literacy rate is 97%, so we were really excited until we purchased the ninth grade book which showed how to tell time and how to put ing at the end of a word. And then my uh, son was uh, obviously saying, what are we going to do about my education? And we had no other plans. We didn't know. We sold our house, our cars, everything, and we were panicking um, until we found out that there is an internet school and the two oldest boys of my sons went to the internet school, whereas Jordan uh, went to a small school on the island of Ambergris Key. Um, and we moved to that island because the hut just wasn't working. It, there was, it was just too much and there were no other kids around, so they had no one to interact with, plus they weren't gonna go to the school there. And it was a retirement community, so they weren't very thrilled about living with no other children. So we moved to Ambergris Key, and we had our dog with us, Cookie, and she's sitting behind the pilot there on the little Cessna uh, going from Corozal to Ambergris Key. Cookie is still with us, so she went to Belize and she's still with us today here. And. Um, so my husband, we found a house which was one of four villas, this one here, and there's three others. And um, my husband could finally relax. And uh, what we ended up doing was we bonded with a local family of Belizeans, a mother, a father, and their little boy, little Juan, who is four years old. And my son Jordan adopted this little boy uh, who couldn't speak any English at all when we arrived. And after two days, he's already mimicking what they're saying. And this is Jordan with little, uh, so with little Juan in his raincoat. And he tried to help him uh, learn English. And uh, anyway, this is where I think my son Jordan changed. Every day, we took him to school by boat, and he had to wear school uniform. Um, the kids, in, the Belizean kids treated school as a privilege, not as a right. This is Jordan in his little school there. Um, and one evening when we invited our caretakers over, Juan and Teresa, who spoke Spanish at home, and yet their English was pretty good, Juan summarized their short life together. He was 21 and Teresa was 20 and they had married at 17 and 16 and had little Juan nine months later. I asked them, what about high school? I quit school at 12 to work in the sugarcane fields, Juan said. I worked from five in the morning to five in the afternoon, seven days a week. My boys were listening to them and they turned completely quiet. I got paid $75, which I give my dad to pay for food. He paused, took a sip of water, and continued. I have 11 brothers and sisters. 
Teresa also quit school at 12 because her parents couldn't afford the school books. My boys liked Juan and listened to every word he said. No lecture in the world could have been more effective than Juan's story in teaching my boys gratitude and how privileged they were to get an education. How our family grew closer in Belize was no cable TV, no cell phones. We did have computers, but the electricity was sporadic. And one of the things that we did as a family was uh, we did have a few DVDs and we would, my husband would every night uh, give us a choice of five DVDs and we would vote on two of them. And when Duke started the DVD and three minutes into the movie, the electricity shut off. And used to this from before he we arrived, Duke grabbed his emergency flashlight from the shelf above the couch and lit a candle. The boys and I sat in darkness. Uh, this usually happens on Saturdays and Sundays, Duke said, not Tuesdays. Why did we move here? It's so backwards, Alex said. It's different, I said. How long does it last? As long as they want it to, Duke said. You're kidding. So we get our electricity from Mexico? Yeah, but it also depends on whether the Belizean government paid its bill. Who told you that, I asked, a Belizean. So it got cozy with all of us huddled together with no TV, no music, no entertainment, except our voices and a flickering candle. This would never have happened in Orange County. The kids would have found some excuse to leave, but now we only had one another. So the kids' priorities changed from buying unnecessary stuff to wanting a fresh glass of milk. Our new motto was, if they don't have what you want, want what they have. <laughs> buying food was always a problem because the stores never had a constant supply, and they would frequently say, no, I, we don't have it. And then they would laugh and shrug their shoulders. So after a while, you got so used to it. You didn't expect anything. The kids drank powdered milk from Mexico, and as I said, the first thing they wanted when they came back to Orange County was a glass of milk. It had never occurred to me that hunting down food and getting enough of it to feed my hungry boys would become a full-time job. This was something I'd taken for granted in the US. Um, one example of a dinner ritual was I was looking for some penne pasta and the shelf collapsed. All 15 containers landed on the floor with rice and pasta spilling on the counter. I scooped the pasta into a pan of boiling water and after five seconds, a swarm of small black things floated on the surface. They were fleas, so I ladled them off the surface. This was all the pasta I had left. And everyone was starving. Duke and I rinsed the pasta with bottled water, trying our best to unglue the fleas one by one. Thankfully, the tomato sauce and brown pepper camouflaged the residual fleas, and the kids never complained. Hunger did wonders for my uh, lowering my standards. And without a garbage disposal or dishwasher, the kids learned to finish whatever was on their plate. Uh, scooping leftover oatmeal or scrambled eggs out of the sink with their bare hands was pretty gross. The rain was our friend as it offered a dishwasher alternative. We arranged our dirty plates next to the glass, glassless window, kitchen window, and the raindrops pooled on our lopsided kitchen counter. The dishes cleaned, just a bad dab of palm olive, and voila. So the uh, kids started things together, which they didn't do here in Orange County, like fishing and noticing their environment, spending time just looking. Um, life was a much slower pace, standing on the palm tree. Uh, nature was our entertainment. This we scooped up from just by the boat dock. Um, and then my husband Duke had time for his sons, finally. And the kids would sit and huddle around and talk. And that was something that I noticed when we came back 
They, I found them in my living room talking. We, we have no furniture except patio furniture when we came back and they formed a circle and entertained one another and other kids thought they were crazy. Um, so life became simple and more about family and compassion. Duke and I, of course, I didn't talk about the business aspect, but we struggled to get a business going. Our first option failed due to sporadic electricity and internet. We couldn't work for the American companies. We had been living off our savings. Finding a business became a family project. The kids started to feel that they needed to help too. And in the discussions, they came up with crazy ideas like, let's start a paintball business for the local <laughs> Belizean kids on the island. <laughs> or, you know, crazy things. And uh, so we tried another business, but we soon realized that we had made a mistake. We tried a property management business. And <coughs> The mistake that we made is we thought we could run a business in Belize according to the American paradigm, but soon realized that things don't work the same way over there. And I think it was my fault because I was a little too pushy. I, I was worried that my husband would turn into a lazy beach bum. I said, two months, you're allowed two months, then we have to start a business. So I was always going to the Chamber of Commerce, come on, let's start something. But no, that was a big mistake. Anyway, um, so as far as that, the business side didn't work, but the family grew really close together, especially when a few bad things started happening to us. Um, I, a little excerpt, I headed to the beach, cookie behind me sniffing the sand. Loud hammering noises came from inside the boat, where my boys were working together as a team. They built this little a plywood boat in a day um, and yeah the motor the, the motor was from uh, a, an old sailboat the motor was new but my uh, son uh, we had pulled him away from Orange County where he was getting in trouble in high school with girls and different things and we figured an old sailboat is better than an <laughs> these problem girlfriends that he was having in Orange County so he could fix the damn sailboat instead. And that motto came from it, but he started building with his, that kept him busy. So um, they worked together as a team and a camaraderie blossomed between the three of the boys, something I never anticipated prior to our move. I proudly soaked this as in as another memory to cherish. This is what I'd secretly been hoping would happen when we left materialism and our family problems behind in Orange County. In conclusion, I want to say that I'm very proud of my three sons. Despite the, the problems that we had, the, the educational system, one of them graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering from University of Michigan. The middle son that had the poison wood on his hand um, is at UCSB and did a summer internship at Stanford in cancer research. And Jordan, my youngest, is in his senior year at New Mexico Military Institute. And he is the one that this story is about. I know that Belize changed him. He, I think the family with the little Belizean boy and the compassion and everything is what made him see things differently because he didn't feel like he belonged in the Orange County school when he came home, he begged to go to a military school. And he enlisted in the National Guard at 17 and he's totally passionate about his career in the Army. He um, did his um, basic training last year in Fort Benning and he's going back in June for his advanced training. And so, how can I not be proud of my sons? And how can I not be proud of my Jordan? So I'm very glad to have shared this one year in Belize with you and how it changed my family and how it changed Belize. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I would like to know if all of you got a raffle ticket. Yes, thanks for us. Not yet. Most of us not yet. No, not yet. And well, this is a separate raffle. Yeah. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer, but I also, 
I have written a book called Three Ways to Flip Flops, A Family's Year of Gutsy Living on a Tropical Island, and it's being published right now. Hopefully it'll be out by the end of June, and I'd love to share it with you if you're interested. And if any of you uh, belong to a book club, I'd be very happy to come and talk to your book club and give a free book to you, or if you wanted to host it and, and give away, and also donate part of the proceeds to... Is it your 50-50, uh, your military scholarship? Is that the fund? That, that, that is one, one, one possibility, of but you had said, and I, I think this group would, would acknowledge that you have other avenues that you uh, might, might share your eventual book profits mm -hmm. with, and we would support any of those. Okay. Right? Well, thank you. But um, anyway, this... I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions, as I said, I can have them. Thank you. Have any questions for Sonia? Yes. Uh, how long have you been back now? We came back in 2005. And the reason it's taken this long for my book is that I've never written before and I've been taking classes and also going to conferences and just the, the process of writing I have in you. I have finally discovered why it takes this long to write a, a book. Before I used to think anyone could write a book in, in a couple of months, and now I know why they can't, unless they're really good and famous. So, yeah, we got back in 2005. And we moved back to Orange County, but we didn't move to the same neighborhood. We downsized, we lived in this much, uh, we don't live on that, in that beautiful house anymore. And we're ready, to, um, my husband and I are ready to take off and go to some other adventure uh, anytime. So if you can think of anywhere we can go. <laughs> so other questions? Other question? Yeah. Other I question? have one. What's that? I went to a recent, and I told you I was going to ask you this. Right. I went to a recent uh, Naval War College symposium and found uh, that on the hierarchy of how many murders per 100,000 police was number four in the world. Wow. Uh, lost, well, Cal uh, the United States, which would include everybody, was number 23. Uh, did you notice that when you were in Belize, that there was a lot of, of, of threat? Yeah, it's kind of funny because uh, I think that the type of people, especially women who do well in Belize, are women who are very strong and uh, you have to show this macho side of you. Um, I, when my husband left and went back to the US while I was alone on the island, I actually slept with a machete and under my pillow, and, or my husband's pillow, and a rolling pin because I never knew if someone was gonna break in. Sounds like an oora to me. <laughs> and um, I don't know if it was me being overly afraid, uh, because obviously when you project fear, that's not good. And I've always, my, my expat friends who'd been living on the island much longer than me from the US, because you make friends very quickly, they told me, Sonia, that you, you have to be strong. Do not show any fear. But when I would ride my bicycle to town, which was five miles away, and I'd ride on the, on the dirt path in the jungle area, I was always terrified that somebody would jump out of the, the jungle and attack me. And there was a, a lady there from Michigan who was uh, 75, living alone. She was a psychologist, and I always admired her. And she, um, she just, she was fearless. And yeah. So, if she could do it, then I certainly could too. So. Good on. Good Thank on. you. Uh, so, a second question, follow-on question. Uh, when, when Mary and I were assigned to the Philippine Islands, we took our children then about uh, 11 and 15 or something like that to try and accommodate them to the fact that they would be going to a foreign country. We took them down into Mexico and uh, to give them an idea of a different country. And as I remember it, as we wandered through Mexico on a, on a car tour, 
uh, my younger son, 11 at that time, said, did they have a war here? <laughs> I mean, there was a huge cultural difference, and you kind of alluded to that, that hello your children now bounce into this country where some of the people don't have shoes, uh, yeah. there's not a lot of foods that they're familiar with, and so my question is, did you prepare your children for that or did you just kind of wait for total immersion? We, we did not prepare them. Um, one of the reasons is that uh, my husband didn't want to back out of this and uh, he, another reason, like selling our house. I said, shouldn't we rent it in case things don't work out? And he said, no, we sell it because we don't want to give them an excuse to say, hey, let's go home. Um, so it was immersion, and um, to be honest with you, I don't think you can prepare them. Really, I don't think you can prepare them for that. I mean, I have no clue that a big, huge scorpion would come out the shower the minute my son goes in the shower. Or you touch a poison tree. Oh, the poison wood tree. I didn't know anything about that. So. My children came down with malaria. Hello. Oh, gosh. But anyway, um, I, I yes, thank, thank you, you so much, thank Sonia. You very much. Very nice presentation. Oh, she wants to... This this is for my book, when it comes out, a free copy, and the winner here is number 202626. That's me. Yay, good. You did you put out a thing with the email addresses? No, I put little uh, colored paper there. If you are interested in staying in touch with me and my business card is there so I've got my email and everything if you want but to But if you that. would just put your email yeah. address on one of those red red cards. Or green. Red or green. Red or green cards. Uh, she will let you know when the book, book comes, comes out. out. Or you can go to my website and there is a little book notification if you want mm. to do it that way. But I would love to, uh, if any of you love to write, I also have a contest going on my blog constantly called My Gutsy Story. And if any of you are writers and you have a story you want to share, go to my website as well and, and look at the guidelines because... And I if have you have a story that you want to share and do not share with me as a potential program, you are in serious trouble. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for being here and listening to me. Thank you, Sonia. We got a press here. Oh, yes. Uh, if I can get here, you go. That's done. No, that's fine. This is, I can't use my hand. Okay. As a token of our appreciation, uh, this is your remuneration for the evening, uh, and uh, hopefully that uh, you are a coffee drink. Oh, I guess tea would go in here also. Uh, so here's a commemorative bug painting our logo and uh, and thank you so very very much. Thank you so much. Well, Sonia is probably one of the very few people in this group who has actually been to the MOA website. Oh. <laughs> thank you so yes, much. Yes, thank you. We're ready for the uh, drawing of yours. Go ahead. We have the floor. My assistant will take over. Uh, 